Hello and welcome to this very special Arlington Independent Media Forum on Citizen Journalism. I'm going to moderate today's program and I'm Christian Dorsey and we have assembled a group of people to talk about, well, a topic that's as old as our republic itself, citizens getting involved in reporting the news. Now, we watched some videos where we see that even though citizen journalism is kind of a, a recent topic du jour, a, a recently coined term, in fact, it goes back for decades with the Zapruder film and even centuries when you think about Thomas Paine and common sense. But today we're going to talk about this phenomenon in light of the digitization of news media and the ability for more and more citizens to get involved in making news and reporting news. Now we're going to have a top, we're going to have a conversation with everybody here in the room, but to get us started, we have a couple of guests who have been involved in this work for a long time. And I'm going to begin with Jan Schaefer, who's the uh, executive director of JLab. And uh, Jan, I want you to tell us a little bit about JLab, but this is really just the, the most recent um, you know, foray into journalism for you. You were uh, a print reporter uh, for a number of years, traditional journalism, if right. you will, a Pulitzer Prize winner, by the way, um, who has, for the last decade or so, really devoted your professional life to citizen journalism. So tell us a little bit about what it means, Jan. Well, JLab is the center of American University, and one of the things that we have done as part of our scope of work is to actually fund uh, hyper-local news startups, many of them run by ordinary citizens. And we have funded 55 of those um, since 2005, when really a lot of these uh, community news sites started to take off. And we also have a women's media entrepreneurship program in which we award women who do entrepreneurial news and information startups. So we've been pretty steeped in this for a while now, I think. And I don't know that you'd like me to go on and sort of talk about some of the trends we're seeing. Well, let's talk about really why, you know, 2005, you know, really the past six, seven years or so, we've seen not only uh, lots of terms, uh, you know, many people may call it hyper-local journalism. I think right. you mentioned that, bottom-up journalism, open right. source journalism. It goes by many names, but, but really, what's allowed it to proliferate and to really become such a part of our consciousness? I think there are a number of factors. I think certainly the, uh, the rise of technology that's very accessible for people. There are content management systems like WordPress that are virtually free that you can use to create what looks like a website and you don't have to pay a web developer. I think there are um, news or traditional news organizations are pulling back coverage in certain areas and people in the community notice those areas and they see an entrepreneurial opportunity really for them to fill those gaps. Um, and then there are a number of downsized journalists who are left their newsroom, still want to do journalism, and are, are also looking to fill those gaps. All right, so technology and, and the uh, democratization of the ability to put stuff out there and problems in the traditional journalism industry, those are a couple of things that actually work very well with a, a second guest that we have in the audience today, Steve Thurston, who is the executive director of the Arlington Community News Lab and the editor-in-chief of its uh, flagship publication, the Arlington Mercury. And in full disclosure, I'm a member of the board for Steve's organization. But Steve, I respond a little bit to what Jan was talking about and, and what the what your work is all about. Yeah, I, I totally agree with what she's saying with the, you know, the the inexpensive technology, the ability to get out there and distribute. I mean, distribution used to be the one of the biggest costs. You know, you'd you'd all of a sudden find yourself with papers on your doorstep and you either had to pay somebody to to deliver them or uh pay for postage and that kind of thing, and all of that's gone with online media. Um on top of that, what WordPress and Blogger and the other blogging sites allowed uh, was people to be able to say, I want to cover just this, either this notion, this topic, this issue, or this neighborhood, you know, whatever it is. You could pick just this niche um, and say, this is what I'm going to cover from now on. Um, and so it allowed you, you didn't have to reach the, uh, the huge audience that you would if you were trying to maybe do some sort of a, a print publication. So one of the films, uh, one of the, the bits that we saw before we began this conversation was the, uh, the famous Abraham Zapruder film, which was, uh, you know, the, the most direct footage that captured the assassination of John F. Kennedy. And, you know, that film lives on in lore not only because of its graphicness and its, uh, its historic and politi political significance, but because 
an ordinary guy got it and mainstream journalism didn't get it. How much is that part of this, this phenomenon? How much are we missing from mainstream journalism, if you will, that requires this void to be filled by citizen journalists? Jan? You know, I think that one definition of citizen journalism is to be the eyewitness to breaking news. And what we're seeing is that with people walking around with cell phones that on the, uh, usually have a digital camera capacity to them, um, they can inadvertently find themselves with news happening right in front of them. And I think increasingly their, their reaction is to get, take and shoot or run a video on it. Um, so we're seeing um, video from Hurricane Katrina. Katrina, video from the tsunamis in Southeast Asia, bridges falling down, there's a video of it. Um, journalists can't be in all of these places anymore. There are not enough feet on the street. So, um, you know, this is one aspect of citizen journalism that I think is, is helping other people have immediate access to breaking news events. Well, I want to open this conversation up to everybody. I want to, you know, hear some initial thoughts on this phenomenon of citizen journalism and kind of what your observations and thoughts on it are. Paul. Um, well, I'm Paul LaValle. Uh, I'm the executive <coughs> director of Arlington Independent Media, and I'd like to, first of all, thank everybody for coming uh, today um, and helping us out with this discussion. Um, my, I guess my question or my observation combination is, uh, what's the role for editing in this world? Um, it seems to me, you know, Example, uh, I was on the street the other day at a stoplight and um, a couple of unmarked police cars pulled over the car ahead of me and uh, guns drawn, pulled three people out of the car, had them on the ground, were arresting them. I looked around, three different people were videotaping with their cell phones. Um, so I totally see what you're saying and I, and I see it myself on the street, but the question is, if everybody's shooting everything, is there what is the role for a gatekeeper or an editor or someone to direct the activities of people? I mean, are we have we given up that notion? Hmm. Steve, do you want to attack that since I know no. you're always around town with your ubiquitous uh, iPad? Um, yeah, I, it, it's an interesting question because, of course, those the the first. The first people really to take a hit at some of the more traditional media, especially at newspapers, were the proofreaders and the copy editors. Mm. The ones who you couldn't see who would go through something and say, this isn't quite right and that's not quite right and do you know how to spell and that kind of thing to the reporter. Um, and so that was one of the first levels of, of editor, editor level cuts to be made. And, and yeah, I mean, you could definitely start to see it. And so when it, when it comes to that role of somebody getting footage of a police officer arresting somebody, there's, there's value to that, but at the same time, I'm not sure that that's enough necessarily. That it, at some point, people are going to say, "Yeah, but I want to know what they're being arrested for, and I want to know why the police had to arrest them here, and did they have to draw their guns, and and all that sort of thing." I mean, and that's that's where editing comes in. That's even if even if you have no editor, you have somebody yourself or you know another colleague you're working for, hopefully, who's saying saying we should call these people you know let's at least call up somebody and find out what was really going on here and that kind of thing I mean it, it makes for a nice splash but I'm not sure um, what people get out of it mm. Mm. Well, um, yes full, full disclosure uh, my name is Mary Jean I'm on the board of the um, Arlington Mercury as well and I'm a dinosaur print journalist finding my way in the internet age so I'm gonna tampen down the enthusiasm for citizen journalism just a bit I mean I think it, it's definitely a role to play, but it, like watching Steve's organization, you still need to have um, trained journalists providing content as your first sort of, I think, uh, go-to sources here. Because if you notice like the Arlington Mercury, what, what I've seen Steve do is look at the vacuum in coverage in Arlington of really important issues, housing, um, Columbia Pike, uh, uh, topics that simply the Washington Post is not picking up and he is using his journalism background to identify that lack of coverage and to, to bring it to light and I think he can marshal the forces of citizen journalism within that um, but before you get I think I, th I think before we can go too far with it you really do need to emphasize the role of uh, someone like Steve who's got experience and can can pick the subjects that need to be covered 
can find people who can cover them accurately without bias, um, which is why, which brings credibility to a site like his, and to train and nurture those citizen journalists. Mary, you bring up some important points, and you know, print. The print, or I'm sorry, the traditional uh, news industry at once was resistant to this whole idea, but seemingly in recent years, Jan has come to really embrace it and almost uh, incorporate it into its operations. Can you speak about that evolution and, and um, kind of the concerns that Mary brought up? I don't know whether I would call it embracing it. I think you have to unpack <laughs> the term a, a yeah. little bit more yeah. because I think there, there are certainly citizen eyewitnesses to news, and, and that's fine and well and good, but I think we also see many other things happening that fall under the rubric of citizen journalism. You know, we're seeing around the country the rise of independent investigative news sites. Many of these are run by traditional journalists, but not all of them. You know, California Watch, um, Voice of San Diego, Texas Tribune, Wisconsin Watch, um, and they're doing genuine accountability journalism throughout the country. There are now 64 members of the investigative news network. They're organized. So, you know, that's one aspect. Another aspect of citizen journalism really is the small hyperlocal news sites, are like Arl, Arl mm -hmm. Now, Arlington mm -hmm. Now, which just opened Bethesda Now, that are sort of all digital and, mm -hmm. and, and producing kind of breaking news. Um, you've got universities that are now doing news sites that are covering more than just campus news. They're out there in the community covering community news. You've got all kinds of niche sites opening. You've got sites covering public schools, like the Public School Notebook in Philadelphia. You've got Bike Portland in Portland covering the biking community. You've got arts and culture sites opening because mainstream media is not really covering arts and culture anymore. So within all of this, you're, you're getting a quite a, a robust kind of ecosystem of news and information. Yes, it's produced by citizens, but a lot of it has a lot of journalistic DNA. So, you know, that brings up just a question, and I'm curious as to the thoughts of the audience on this. I mean, there, you know, you mentioned the many sites around the country, but I'm sure we could find their, um, you know, their similar, similar counterpoints here in the D.C. metro area, and it leaves us as people um, left to figure out where to find the news. How has this democratization of the media uh, been on net, positive or, or negative, for just ordinary people and how they find information? Anybody? Anybody? You can't just open your Washington Post anymore and get all the news. You have many sites that you maybe need to, to look at. Yes? I'm, I'm Jerry Barney. Um, I'm the executive director of a nonprofit here called Our Task. It's a, a network of young adults who are really worried about what kind of a planet they're going to be inheriting. Mm -hmm. And you talk about a vacuum in the news. We really sense there's a huge vacuum of coverage of the decisions that are being made that have a huge impact on the future of young people. And we've worked with AIM and created a, a show that we call News for Our Future here. But uh, you know, I have to say we're we're just all stumbling into this and not not really knowing what we're doing. Uh, we're none of us are journalists, and uh, you know we've we've got a backpack camera, and uh, and uh, we get training from from here and from from others. Uh, but you know, we uh, we need some. Uh, exposure to how you get the word out and how you build your audience that's that's something we haven't figured out at all so that I'm just speaking from the standpoint yes. of a, a citizen journalist who is struggling a little with that issue mm -hmm. can we talk about that I mean anybody else besides uh, Jan and Steve who's sort of involved in these efforts and can kind of pass on some best practices to our friend who's just getting involved Steve I was gonna Answer your first question. Okay. <laughs> it's time, a free form discussion. We'll come back to everything. What Jerry said. Uh, I'm Steve Cordell, and I'm a member here. Um, you ask, where am I getting my news? Well, between Facebook and Twitter and Google News, I'm following Mer Arlington Mercury. I'm following RLNow.com. I'm following Clarendon Patch and Boston Patch, which I think are now joined. And uh, also get the afternoon buzz feed from the Washington Post. So the answer is, 
I'm getting my news from a lot of places and none of it from print except on Sundays. Okay. <laughs> and but you're using technology in order to make it easy for you to consume all of that. Right. Yeah. Yes. And do you feel like you're getting more news now than you got when there was just the Washington Post? I do. I'm getting in different. In, in Arlington. But I don't, and I'm, <laughs> sorry, I'm getting, I'm getting different news. And I think I'm getting more news because I really, uh, since I since I retired, I'm not I wasn't reading the Post every day anyway, but now and because of all of these uh, opportunities to get news over the internet, I'm actually getting a lot more news than I used to. Okay. Yes, sir. Well, going back to the previous gentleman, I also have a, a TV series I produce. I'm John Wetmore. I produce Perils for Pedestrians. I'm on public access stations around the country. I'm also on YouTube. And YouTube, uh, every minute they have dozens of hours of new video uploaded. And it's very easy to get lost there. And you know, I've been on uh, video sharing sites since, you know, 96 or thereabouts. Wow. Uh, um, and Head of the curve. And, but the, you know, the ground keeps changing underneath you. This morning, I discovered YouTube will let me use my own name on my channel and not just the, the, the original channel name with the URL. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, all of a sudden, I could upload my own thumbnails instead of choosing from the ones they generated. So, so the ground is constantly changing. It's, it's actually tough to keep up. Um, I mean, there are some resources out there. YouTube has a, a creator playbook, they call it, that has some very useful information into it. Um, but you know, they're already on their second edition of it because things keep changing so fast. Mm. So let's talk about that, that rate of change. I mean, that's certainly the case with anything that's based on technology. There's always newer and faster and better or arguably better ways of doing things. Does that constant state of change, does that energize you? Steve, I'm gonna, I'm gonna go to you first or is oh, that yeah, something a that's a big fun. problem? No, it's a lot of fun. I mean, it's just, you do have to, you do, you're constantly thinking of new ways and you're constantly looking at stuff and thinking, all right, now I've gotta learn this thing. Um, but I find it fun. I mean, I do. I, I, I buy the, the gadgets that go with my iPad and um, do almost all of my reporting from an iPad. I can shoot video. And um, I've got an iPad, too, and the still, the still camera on that is absolutely terrible. Um, but the video camera is, you know, it's decent, especially if you're going to go um, and post to YouTube and put it on a, on a computer screen. Um, and I've gotten a new mic for it so that I can get decent audio quality out of it. and. Um, I started podcasting a couple of weeks ago. I got a podcast channel um, for the Merck, and so we're doing some audio as well, and um, just kind of having fun with it. I mean, that is that is part of the fun. I, I also teach journalism, and so I kind of have to stay up on top of this stuff anyway, or else my students would be well beyond me. Um, you know, and, and that's no fun going into the classroom, knowing that they know way more than you do. So. And Jan, in your role, you get to work with many organizations across the country, and do you find that, like Steve, they sort of embrace the constant state of change, or does that provide a challenge for a lot of the uh, groups that you may work with? I think the news organizations embrace it. Where, where it's difficult is for the journalism schools, because mm -hmm. the big debate right now is, well, wow, how many of the tools and toys do we <laughs> teach when there are something else coming along the following year we can't and buy new stuff every it's very year. hard to keep up mm -hmm. or do you more focus on journalism values journalism techniques journalism conventions and forget the tools and toys it's very hard to figure mm -hmm. out what yeah. the balance is yeah. always new toys indeed you know I, I wanted to ask a question and before we get to Paul here um, I was reminded not too long ago uh, about the, uh, the mid 90s Rodney King uh, in Los Angeles mm -hmm. that's sort of a, a, another classic textbook example of citizen journalism and and you know the person who was initiating the discussion with me you know brought <coughs> up a point that I had never really considered that we may never know whether or not the police actions in any way were legitimate but the release of that video to the world automatically uh, you know made everyone uh, you know who watched it believe that that was an egregious overreach mm -hmm. of police authority and yet I can't remember who brought it up, the, the questions of, well, uh, Paul, you brought it up with your earlier example. What were the circumstances? What had happened prior to the time record was hit? Uh, what's the history there? None of that, that context took, you know, years to come out, but the initial, initial feelings were, were cemented right away. So mm -hmm. anyway, go ahead, Paul. Uh, excellent comment. Um, 
we're, I think there's no question but what the power of uh, citizen journalism is uh, enormous. Um, another example being the uh, hidden recording of the presidential candidate recently, which seems to have changed the dynamics of the presidential race. Oh, the 47 percent comment. That's, yeah. that's yeah. the one. Um, <laughs> but as an organization, uh, AIM, we are uh, really uh, struggling with the, um, the rapid change in technology. Because one of our missions, like uh, journalism schools, is, is to teach people. And um, by the time you're finished teaching a technology, it's out of date. And so right now, you know, one of the, uh, the impetus for this discussion today is, is our trying to feel our way into teaching citizen journalism, actually sending journalists out um, you know, uh, to cover events around the community. And we've had already weeks of discussion about, well, what should we send them with? Are we sending them with iPads? Are we sending them with uh, $35,000 cameras on their shoulder? Are we sending them with whatever they have in their pocket? Mm -hmm. um, it's not an easy, I mean, it's not an easy thing. So with every opportunity, technology-wise, uh, organizations like us are faced with tremendous uh, challenges. Mm -hmm. So, you know, with that, with people being able to produce content with whatever is in their pocket, you know, what does this do to the organizations or the people who've made the multi tens of thousands of dollars investment in, you know, other equipment that we used to consider the gold standard for providing content out there? You know, uh, I'm just... I have no idea where I'm going with that question, but it seems like, you know, a great, you know, a great... Uh, a great inefficiency there if people are able to produce with what they've got, what it took people at one point, you know, tens of thousands of dollars to do, produce. Steve? Yeah, I, I'll, I'm sorry, I think there was another answer. Well, um, yeah, the stuff that you can get here at AIM, at AIM, is still way better than an iPad. I mean, there's just no two ways about it. It's, it's if you're getting trained on the stuff here, on the, the actual equipment here, it's all way better than anything you can get that can fit in your pocket. Um, you know, flip cameras were hot for about a year and then they died when everybody realized, oh, my cell phone can do better than this. <laughs> um, but the TV cameras that are, you know, shooting this right now aren't gonna go away anytime soon. Um, the quality in the video is better. Um, on my iPad, for instance, I cannot zoom on my video camera, mm. so I have to tell people when I'm interviewing them, step a little closer. <laughs> <laughs> you know, take, True manual zoom. Exactly, exactly. Move you closer. come closer to me. Um, you know, I'll be shooting myself on my iPad, and I'm guessing at where I am in the frame, and then looking at it, and then going back, and that kind of thing. And, and it's, um, you know, the, the sound quality isn't nearly as good. There's one microphone. Um, that is made for the iPad right now that works really well with the iPad and that gets it at, at passable quality audio that doesn't get it up to um, What you would use here. It doesn't get you up to a radio stations audio anywhere near that kind of quality um, And so it's it's neat to see people you know cutting their own demos and that kind of thing on iPad But you know Sony isn't going to turn around and Sony music is not going to start using the iPad to cut music anytime soon so, you know, so it's, still a quality advantage. Oh, it, there's the, definitely okay. a quality advantage to it. And, that and that knowing how to use the better, stuff. Right? <laughs> yeah. But I also think that, you know, it, it's, it's a custom the audience to good enough. Mm -hmm. um, it, it do, you don't have to have any more that such high professional standard where you would never air anything unless it mm -hmm. were there. Good enough to broadcast or good enough to upload is good enough mm -hmm. for now. That actually, the American Press Institute, before it went out of business or it was subsumed, um, that one of they every year they would have a theme for the year of what they wanted. They they were they were an ink on the fingers journalism group, and they fought turning into an, an internet group for years and years. And then all of a sudden they said, "Oh, this isn't going away." And so what they did was they said, "Let's." Let's start telling all these people who have ink on their fingers and who we've been telling for years, it's okay, you guys are the real journalists. What they turned around and said was, you know what, good enough is good enough. Let's start getting stuff on the web and just, and they, uh, I went to conferences there, seminars there, where they called it good enough journalism for on the web, you know, where you would go and, and they would say, look, this is lousy audio and it's a shaky camera and, and it's, you know, somebody you can barely hear, but it's the news. Let's, let's get it out there and let people see 
Um, and from that, they developed this whole notion of newspapers next, where they were going to sort of help newspapers become the next great online thing, and then they lost their funding, and that was pretty much it. Thank you. We have a comment in the back there. I'm Karen Ackerson. I'm a member here. And actually, <coughs> what we're really talking about is the fact that it requires us to think differently and that indeed we can have all the equipment which is going to consistently and constantly change. But what we have to be able to do is to develop to be able to assess and analyze in ways that we haven't been challenged to do f before because we did have journalists. We did have journalists at times that we trusted. We had newspapers that we trusted, that we relied upon. And when they wrote things, we believed in those things that they wrote. And today we don't have that. Today we have to rely on ourselves. And so it requires a whole different way of thinking of how we vet and analyze and think about what we're viewing, the accuracy, the context, how it was created, who created it, why they created it, and how we should take that and what we should take away from that experience. So it's not being given to us anymore. It's requiring us to think differently. And so for the generation, of people who are used to the newspaper still going to it. Yes, you know, it's a generational thing as well. But for the youth, how are they thinking about it? And how is it really changing from the standpoint of their view to be able to grow up in a world where they're not able to rely upon those traditional resources? Well, let's explore that, because that's a... Uh... I'd like to add a little bit to that. I'm John Craig. I, uh, I'm on the board here at AIM. But, um, when I think I'm correct to say that when WikiLe Wiki WikiLeaks released a lot of the confidential documents uh, onto the internet at one point, um, the Columbia School of uh, Journalism, the graduate school at Columbia, uh, uh, sent out an email warning, I think, students or professors or others not to even read this something like that and they were embarrassed later within a day or t within 24 hours they were so embarrassed that they retracted that statement mm -hmm. but I'm, I'm bringing that up because back to your point that you know who do we trust and certainly that is a prestigious school of journalism they've taught some amazing journalists and instilled in them you know ethics that are to be honored but at the same time they're under pressure about funding and things like that and sometimes you think, well, a citizen isn't really um, under pressure about funding and it, will the government give me grants and things like that. So a citizen might, like, like Thomas Paine, just put it out there and, and, and uh, put the truth out there. Uh, I just kind of wanted to raise that too because it was back to your issue that, you know, who do we trust? Uh, sometimes these prestigious schools that we have trusted, I think, rightly for, for decades, we're seeing that you know they're under a lot of financial pressure, mm -hmm. and so it's back to the, the question of, of money and finance again. Mm -hmm. Yes, Mary. Yeah, my name is Mary <coughs> Rulo. I run a nonprofit here. I'm also a high school teacher. I'm going to the point you made about trusting, and one of my kind of pet peeves is media literacy, and I think one of the questions you have to ask is, especially in the age of citizen journalism, you know, is it more incumbent upon us? to worry about this issue. And I can tell you at the high school level, it's almost not relevant at all. In other words, it's not being done. Um, I think there's a lot of sources out there. If you're fairly educated and you know what you're looking for, you can probably separate out you know, the legitimate stuff from just the crap, frankly. Um, but I think that's a, a real concern I had as a teacher. Kids, all the kids I taught, you know, all the kids I taught in high school, and some of them are quite old, they were adults in high school, they all love current events but they really have a hard time navigating, mm -hmm. putting the pieces together. So I'd just like to put a plug in for that, that while I realize as journalists you all have challenges, there's also the, the receiver end, and I think that needs more attention. Yes, Jan. One of the things, uh, one of the subspecialties that is emerging as a result of citizen journalism is really uh, something akin to the forensics of journalism. And certainly with the launch of WikiLeaks before the New York Times or the Washington Post took that data dump, if you will, they had, they had to verify that it was what it was claimed to be, um, which takes some time to do. And, and that has now developed into a whole specialty. There is a, an internet startup called Storyful. They're based in Dublin now. And what they do 
is they validate Twitter's, Twitter feeds, tweets coming out of, um, you know, Arab countries throughout the Arab Spring. And it's fascinating how they're doing this. I mean, you could have a, an explosion or some kind of incendiary happen, happening there. And they actually take the weather for the day, they take past photos of the day of that particular website, they try to align the time of day in the sunlight to determine whether a photo that was posted on Twitter could possibly be a real photo. It's quite an art and a science to try to determine whether somebody's fabricating this or whether it's a real tweet and whether a journalist should pay attention to it or not. So we're seeing all these kind of subspecialties happen now. It's really quite fascinating. You know, it's long been a phenomenon in the, you know, in the sort of traditional journalism world that the, uh, you know, the big splash allegation or newsworthy thing may be on the front page or lead the broadcast, but, uh, you know, if there was an error, there needs to be a correction that's buried <laughs> later on, making it difficult to find. You know, back to this question, you know, that a few of you have talked about. On the receiver end, uh, you know, what are the challenges when there is such the pressure to get things out there right away in as raw a format as possible? And I'm, I'm thinking right now, the most recent one in my memory was uh, when the Supreme Court uh, ruled on the Affordable Care Act and a number of news organizations, you know, it, it read the first paragraph of the opinion but didn't read page two to find out what they actually said. So they, you know, blasted it out. It was incredibly wrong. and. They didn't even worry about really correcting it later. They just amended the splash pages of the websites mm -hmm. later on. Is, is this a good thing for us no. on, on balance? or No, it's terrible. Um, most of the um, studies that are out there say that people do, they remember that. It, it's the old first impression. You remember that first impression and kind of forget if it's been corrected, if you see it. Um, yeah, but there's a lot of times where it's where you know that first impression is what people remember and so if you get it wrong that first time you you might be telling people something that they get wrong forever but before i wrote the Merck, i did the buckingham herald trib which was a small one uh, just in the buckingham neighborhood in arlington and i was surprised by the number of people years after a um a decision had been made not to redevelop these two corners in the buckingham neighborhood for years, people would come up to me and say, oh, you live in Buckingham. I remember there was some big change that's still going on there, and people are going to gonna come in and get rid of that CVS, aren't they? And I'd look at it and just sort of say, that's been dead for two or three years. You know, I mean, they, what they're going, they're, they, they don't read every day. You know, they don't follow it every day the way that we'd like them to. Um, and so we have to be careful. You know, you have to be careful. Well, and I think the whole question of media literacy is really s surfacing in this current political campaign season where we're seeing um, citizens really bombarded with all kinds of advertising with many outright lies in it. Mm -hmm. And journalists are doing their truth squatting. You know, you've got PolitiFact doing this and Fact Check doing that and Glenn Kessler at the Washington Post telling what's true or false. The problem is that m most voters aren't reading those. Right. and. Mm -hmm. So there's just the ads out there making all kinds of claims that are, that are not true. And it's, it's very challenging for the journalists to figure out. And the candidates know mm -hmm. the citizens are not going to read the truth squatting right. part of it. So they just keep doing it. It's, it's very challenging. Yeah, so what do we do about that? I mean, this is such a timely topical issue. Uh, you know, you see the, the fact checkers who you know, give Pinocchios or whatnot, and yet the ads continue to run over our public airwaves, mind you. <laughs> Um, you know, what, what role do we as citizens have in, in seeing that our airwaves are used for truth, at least as best as you can get it? Is there anything we can do to stop that, Jan? You know, it's a, it's a very interesting question whether you can shut down an ad campaign in the middle of a, a campaign, <coughs> if there should be FCC guidelines that sort of, you know, three strikes and you're out kind of thing. I don't, I don't know what the answer would be. It would be very challenging to police. Well, I, I was listening to On the Media, um, which is a public radio um, a news show about the media, and, and they were talking to John Sununu about a particular ad that had been called out as, you know, bald face lie. And he basically argued with, I think it was, um, yeah, I can't remember which host it was with, but he, he basically argued, he, his argument was the fact checkers really are not these godlike 
unobjective or objective and perfect people who get everything right either. That was his basic argument, and then he went on to argue that still the way they spun the ad was okay to have spun it that way, even though it was probably on tricky factual ground that they were <laughs> spinning this on. And so it was, it, was a sort of, it was the same sort of argument that Dan Rather made after it came out that the memo about Bush not really yeah. uh, being <sighs> in the Army. Um, after that came out and Dan Rather said, but all of the facts sort of add up to this. You know, this is just one fact. You can, you can ignore this one fact. And it's like, well, you can't, you can't really, you know, and that's kind of the same argument that Sununu was making. And in, in, you know, the way the First Amendment works, especially with political culture, you, you really can't stop it. I mean, it, right. you can't stop it without putting a big, uh, you know, choke chain on the, on the First Amendment. So. And the Supreme Court has indicated that they want broad, you Yeah, know, they have no interest in changing it broad uh, abilities. Thank God I have TiVo. <laughs> well, it's, it's interesting that um, uh, <coughs> political candidates are the only product sold um, in America that you can just lie about. So mm -hmm. you, you can't make false claims about any other right. product. Right. You would get in trouble for that. But when it comes to political candidates, it seems to be okay. Um, but I actually support that. Uh, as a supporter of the First Amendment, I think it's our duty as citizens to to try to educate ourselves um, and to help others become educated. But actually my original point was, I don't know how many of you have had the experience that I've had recently on Facebook, where occasionally I admit to getting into political discussions. No. Um, you? <laughs> but what happens, what's so interesting is when you are speaking with somebody who has a different political uh, opinion than you do, how divergent your sources of information get right away. Mm. So, you know, you might be uh, referencing the New York Times, they're referencing Town Hall, you're referencing the Washington Post, they're referencing Newsmax, but never the two shall meet. And the, uh, the news from those sources is like completely opposite. Mm -hmm. So, what would a person who was trying to educate themselves, how would they do that? There seems to be endless sources, no matter what your point of view, to back you up. What do people do around here? We all experience this as, as people. Yes. Oh, sorry. Hi, I'm Beverly, citizen. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> oh, I guess I need to stand up. Uh, wading through all this stuff as a citizen is really tough, especially the political landscape. Um, I have two little guidelines for myself. One came back from college, which is primary sources. And number two for myself is, I look at what the candidate has done. I don't listen to what they say, especially if they're telling me what the other candidate believes. <laughs> because I want to hear what you believe, not what you think the other person believes. Because I can't trust that. So. So you'll be a... Uh avid watcher of the upcoming debates, I presume. <coughs> Anybody else have any uh, things that they like to share on things that they do to wade through the often conflicting news sources out there? Yes. Uh, I'm Andy Rosenberg. I'm also a member of AIM. Um, I think what it really boils down to, and this has been said by a number of people, but I think it really needs to be concentrated upon, is media literacy. Um, there is so the information glut has been with us for a long time. It's only intensified, and it's intensified for many reasons. Technology is a big reason. So you really have to have some kind of guidance at an early age to be able to, to have, have consumers of this information make wise decisions, the decisions being what their news sources are primarily. Um, and that's tough because it conflicts with advertising of all sorts. Advertising of the new tech, newest technologies, the uh, whatever your uh, media player uh, happens to be. And for every new device that's put out there on the market, they uh, pressure uh, uh, consumers of, uh, of young ages to, to buy this, and then developers of software 
make software to go onto that device. And a lot of it has to do with feeding information. Anybody that who's, who's, uh, uh, whose job, any organization, any person that wants to get something out, they, they use whatever technology is out there. And they probably are the ones that stay most current about it. So really in public education, I think, and starting in primary school, there has to be some kind of uh, some kind of guidance, some kind of not telling people what to do, what what sites mm -hmm. to go see, but how to think about it. But you know, and this is a, an interesting point because, you know, and Steve, I know that you've experienced this. Uh, you know, there's there are services out there that allow you very easily with no programming experience to develop a website that looks just like many other mm -hmm. news websites. Uh, not to pick on Fox, uh, in full disclosure, I appear in there as a commentator from time to time, but they call themselves fair and balanced. Uh, you know, what do you give people in terms of guidance when things may look like a quote-unquote reputable news source or an objective news source if it all looks the same and, and sounds the same? How do you provide guidance for people to say, but no, this is actually a little bit different? I guess if any of us had that answer, we'd be <laughs> <laughs> probably ruling the media world right now, but yes. Hi, my name is Wendy Mabry. I'm a member here at AIM as well. Um, I, I think what it goes, I would suggest that, as, and I'm a parent of three, um, and I'm learning as I'm in school for my master's right now how valuable it is to not rely on the media at all. Um, to really try to promote or to have a campaign against dependency on the media um, and to kind of get that philosophy preached down the generations to do just kind of become less lazy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, you know, we, I think we're dependent on the media because we're too lazy to actually go and do the homework to research mm -hmm. valuable sources to, you know, almost any case, any situation, you can, you can look up in the courts, court records, court docs, and, you know, and get the actual data rather mm -hmm. than rely on it to be reported to you by a news source. Um, <laughs> I am definitely an advocate of news, so I, I, you know, I don't want to say that it's not needed, but I just think we should, should promote uh, independence from it and not be dependent on it for reporting or for gathering your news, <laughs> the facts. And certainly it is true technology has made that much easier than it was, uh, you know, a generation ago. Absolutely. Any other comments? That we, yeah, Can I just pick up on that a little bit? Yeah. I, um, what, I, what I think people have seen with news outlets is a shift, too, from doing a lot of that sort of legwork work, that, that stuff that says I'm going to go in and I'm going to go to the places. I mean, I'm, I'm going to go and I'm going to talk to the actual people, or I'm going to go and I'm going to read the actual documents, and I'm going to write down what's in them, and I'm going to take that extra time. It's expensive. I mean, that's what it is. And the reason people don't do it is that you all have your jobs and you've got to be someplace else for eight hours, nine hours, ten hours a day. And the last thing you want to do is then say, okay, for the other three and a half, four hours that I'm awake, I'm now going to go to the library and read up on whatever it was that, you know, that hot topic that I want to read up on. And, and that used to be more the job of journalists. And there's definitely been a shift from that. And that is one thing that that's what um oh no I can't remember his name um he started he wrote the wire though and he would he wrote the TV show the oh, wire Simon yeah, yeah thank you Simon and and he um and he would say you know nobody goes to the police nobody goes to the courts anymore nobody goes and talks to the cops nobody goes to the bars and hangs out and gets drunk with the cops to find out what's really going on in Baltimore and and there's a there's a certain truth to that I mean and citizen journalism can definitely pick that up. You know, you get somebody who says, I am really into housing or I am really into, you know, pedestrian issues or whatever. And I'm going to read all of the documents that come out of the Department of Transportation that deal with pedestrian issues. And I'm going to tell people about them. Um, and that can be wonderful. But the problem is, if you want to be somebody who does all of that yourself, you've either got to be really, really rich or retired or both or, you know, or have a, have a staff to go look up most of it for you if you're going to have the time. You know, it's, it's a time-consuming thing. So. so, yeah, I mean, this conversation takes place within the context of, you know, the ever-present financial realities that many uh, traditional news organizations face, the layoffs that people have alluded to earlier, 
the decline of ad dollars, the inability to make the finances work. And, you know, many people may look at citizen journalism as an entrepreneurial activity. I want to talk about that for a minute. Is this becoming something that is becoming um, the you know, does, do people have the ability to, to maintain or create careers out of this sort of activity, or is it still sort of the, uh, the niche activity of people who are just dedicated to a particular cause? Well, there are certainly sites that are launched as hobbies. Um, sometimes they launch as hobbies and you realize, wow, I actually could have a business here when mm. advertisers start knocking on your doors. And um, we are seeing around the country some of these startup founders who are putting it a, a very realistic income off of these. Mm. Could be up to six figures, low six figures a year. Um, they're working around the clock to do it. Mm. And some of them now are getting to a point where they're actually launching satellite sites. So, mm. you know, you'll have one site, Davidson News Net in North Carolina, and they're, they've now launched another one, Cornelius News <coughs> Net, in a bigger place, a bigger community adjacent to it. Um, we're seeing that in more than one place. Yeah. So yeah, they can turn into businesses, but you have to you have to understand the enterprise you're running is not just a work of art. It, it, it you have to think about it as a business and develop it as a business. Yes, comment back there. <coughs> Thank you. I think this is a wonderful discussion. My name is Lou Sagatov. I think we're living in the revolutionary times, you know, when you really think about it. And it's kind of exciting. It's scary, I guess, if you're a mainstream journalist. Uh, but I think it's really exciting. Um, I guess where is the future? I, everybody's, I guess, where is it going? Where are we, mm. we don't know where it's going, but this is the exciting thing. Where is it going? But I think the thing about journalism and traditional people is that they have to really dig in and become the cream of the crop because rising tides lift all ships. And um, if you're going to be the best, you still have to be the best. You just can't just kind of put your hands down and say, gee, now everybody's doing the news and I, I, miss, the, I miss the feed. Mm -hmm. You have to get really, really good at it. And, and so I'm, I think that's an exciting time if you were a journalist to, to be involved with this. Um, I think it's also interesting that <clears throat> the community is coming in on, on so many different levels that we didn't have in mainstream journalism. Um, and you look, uh, years, a couple of years ago during the past uh, election, uh, I was reading mud flats. I don't know. I live in Washington, but I'm reading about Alaska politics. Um, but it was, it was a very interesting blog about Alaska politics and, 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 and very well written, extremely deep uh, and very nasty because politics can get nasty. And, um, but it was, a, it, was a, it, was a, it was a glimpse into the future four years ago to where we are today. And now, you know, we're traveling at such a rapid rate um, that, you know, who cares? The iPhone may, may be the answer to journalism. It may mm -hmm. be. I mean, we're not, we're not in hot spots a lot of times because we can't go to hot spots. We're relying on those, those hot spots to, to send us out an image on an iPhone or, or, you know, electronically. So it's a very interesting time, but, and, you know, and, and the discussion is very good. How do we, how do we, get through this whole process and, and then ultimately it boils down to, you know, how do we educate ourselves and our children, you know, but that's a different subject, I think, <laughs> on this. <laughs> Thank you. No, it's great food for thought. Um, you know, Jan, in, earlier in your career when you were at the uh, Philadelphia Inquirer, you broke a story which was huge. Um, I grew up in, in southern New Jersey and, uh, you know, great great in terms of big uh, congressional corruption scandal. You broke the ab scam story. And I'm imagining that that probably took um, you know, many hours where you weren't really producing, but you were still getting paid because you're working on an important story. You know, are we going to have that luxury of having people who can work a story for weeks, for months on end without producing anything when it comes to the real realities of you know, feeding your family, for example. Is that something that we're going to lose? I think we'll have fewer outlets do that, but I still think we'll have major outlets that, mm -hmm. that do and, and then there'll be other rising news organizations and news sites invest that are really accountability investigative news sites uh, that will fill some of that gap. You know, I think we'll have, we'll have a news ecosystem and rather than being big metro papers and small dailies, We'll have a few large, almost national newspapers, and then a lot of uh, kind of statewide investigative sites, and then hyperlocal sites. And mm. they'll be smaller and smaller pieces, but together 
you know, they'll make up a, a, a pretty vibrant ecosystem. Hmm. So we've got a glimpse, we've got a prediction here for what it might look well, like in the future. Yeah. And if I could, Steve. Christian, um, right along those lines, when I was saying it's a good time to be a young journalist, what I didn't add on there was, for the next 10 years, yeah, we're probably going to have a mishmash of, of, you know, big papers going out or dropping, you know, a good portion of their editorial staff and that kind of thing. And so yeah, that's what makes people nervous. And I think more rightly so, the sort of ink on their fingers journalists are saying, for 10 years, governments are going to have kind of a carte blanche to do what they want because there just won't be enough journalists there. But we don't, we don't have investigative journalism, I don't think, because we... It, it, we want it, but we don't have it because it's it's some sort of absolute necessity. We have it because they could sell papers with it. They could mm -hmm. make money at it. You know, mm -hmm. they could recognize that we're making a ton of money over here, and so we'll pay for Jan to go and do exactly what you were saying, not write a story daily, give her time to go and cover something that's way bigger than that. Um, and uh, that money's going to go someplace. You know, that money, somebody is going to figure out a way to say, we can do this. We just, this is the new way we're going to do it. And I think it's going to take years. I think it's going to take a decade or something. I could be wrong. <laughs> <laughs> now, Jane, you, you mentioned, though, that investigative journalism has become sort of a, a place where there have been some successful entrepreneurial act opportunities. That's something that's probably missing for a lot of people because I've heard over and over again, where is investigative journalism? I want the deep pieces. I'm tired of just getting the little snippets of what happened a few minutes ago. Where can people go find? You know, I don't know, and I don't know if you know, but I don't, I don't know of any sites in Maryland, Virginia, or D.C. I mean, Politico might kind of be a mm -hmm. little, but they're really all politics. Yeah. But if you, if you go to, you know, Voice of San Diego, Texas Tribune, um, mm -hmm. Wisconsin Watch, Vermont Digger, New Jersey Spotlight, um, you know, uh, there, there's they're really a growing the lens in New Orleans, Florida Bulldog. I mean, there's there are these sites cropping up all over the country that are, you know, they don't necessarily publish many stories every day. Mm -hmm. They'll they'll do mm -hmm. a few stories and then work on on big pieces, and they're they're causing they're having impact in their communities. But as of yet, nothing really on the national level to rival what you're seeing. They're on not the focused on the national yeah. level. They're mm -hmm. really focused on state government. Mm -hmm. and States, for the most part, except with the exception of ProPublica, um, oh. they're really focused on, you know, yeah. states. Has anyone here ever been burned uh, by, um, you know, in their professional life, or uh, you know, sort of been burned by the the rush to get media content out there quickly? Um, I've run across people all the time who <laughs> increasingly say that that's true. Paul, well, um, I think the. Um, in my case, the, actually, the problem was the reporter had written the story before he bothered to interview me. Mm. Um, mm. And my quotes were just used to confirm what he had already decided to write. I don't think that is a, um, a function of rush to print mm -hmm. so much as it is a function of just a lazy reporter mm. who... Uh, and, I, and I think that that's going to be the case no matter what the technology is. Some people are just not going to do the work. Is that, you know, Steve and Jan, being people who come from the traditional journalism world, is that important to have people out there who have sort of been seasoned, who have experience in the issues, who kind of know of what they're reporting about so that they're not in situations where they're, you know, just getting things wrong due to laziness or ignorance? I guess that's, a, of course it's good, right? <laughs> <laughs> it's a silly, silly question on my end. But do, do we see Paul's concerns echo throughout the industry, I guess is more the question, where people are just are reporting on these issues who really don't know much about them. Well, I, I, I think there's a couple of different phenomena going on here. Sometimes you'll have just an inexperienced journalist who, you know, is, is building a story and, and the quote is just a piece of furniture they're putting in the story and they don't, they, they don't care what it, it says. I think there are, on the other hand, there are professional journalists who build a story and they need a pro piece of furniture, they need a con piece of furniture, you know, and, and that's the way they arrange the room um, and you don't always come away with a, a reality. So there, there's some bad journalistic conventions, bad journalistic practices that I think we've been uh, exposed to in recent years. Mm -hmm. um, and it's, it's frustrating when it happens and, and people do feel like they've had journalism done to them when it happens. <laughs> journalism done to you. It's interesting. Is there a comment over there? Yes. 
at uh, this point, I had the experience some years back of directing a study of the future of the world for President Carter. And afterward, I had kind of your experience, Paul, of having journalists come to me who had their mind made up already as to what they were going to write about this. And uh, in the course of the interviews, um, you know, all they did is take the things out that supported their point of view and wrote a totally distorted uh, kind of uh, story. Now, as a, as a scientist, I had no preparation for dealing with that circumstance and, and uh, kind of got taken to the cleaners with it. But one other question while I got the mic just to put out is, you know, I hear you talking about how to get the local, the state, maybe the national news. Where do you go to get the global picture? Hmm. Hmm. Someone's probably going to say Twitter. Yes. I was going to comment on the earlier comment. Yeah, that's I fine. <laughs> I can't answer that. Um, but I, I was just going to connect the, the, the dots between the citizen journalism and the urgency to, to get news. And I think that's one of the reasons that citizen journalis journalism has popped up so much is because we all feed off of the urgency to have it right away. And I think um, news, the media as a whole has kind of set that tone because it's from all my recollection, media has always been about who, who has it first, who, who can dish it first. And I think that's going, that's what taints the, the facts and what uh, kind of sets the, um, the kind of initiates the reporters to report stuff before they do a full investigation or before they have all the facts. And so I'm not quite sure what the answer is to it, but I think it's getting worse because of the, the fact that you've got citizen journalism trying to beat the, the actual media outlets to re releasing information. Well, we have to wrap up our conversation very soon. So if someone has a very quick comment, we can get it in, looking around. Otherwise, I mean, this has just been an incredibly interesting conversation, and I am so thrilled to have had the chance to be a part of it. We have touched on many issues and, and have resolved few, but that's always the nature for these kinds of conversations. <laughs> One thing we do certainly know is true is that whatever we've talked about today will probably be obsolete in about six months. So we'll just have to do this conversation again um, and talk about a whole other set of issues and, and concerns that are brought up. Um, you know, I remember some years ago talking to someone about Twitter, and you know, we both kind of had the same, uh, reached the same conclusion. You know, let's talk about Twitter when it's here to stay, and I think it's safe to say that it's here to stay, and the same is true for many other forms of technology and the way we make and consume news. So th this will conclude our AIM Forum on Citizen Journalism, to be repeated as often as necessary as this topic evolves. Thank you all for watching. We hope you have a very great day.